being here, and thank you to Open University of the Left for this kind invitation. Much appreciated. I'm not sure what degree you're all working toward at this university, but there will be a test later. So. Uh, I want to uh, preface my remarks today by extending an invitation. I do have a PowerPoint slide version of the talk I'm giving today that is intended for general audiences in my ongoing efforts to try to awaken or reawaken the people of the United States to the crucial importance of opposing war. U.S.-backed war and the war machine, and ultimately or organizing against the social and economic system that perpetuates war. For that purpose, the visual images of war, as well as the charts and other illustrations that I have in that version of the talk, do tend to add some impact. If after hearing my remarks today, anyone hearing this talk would like to have me present it in that format for an audience in your community, uh, or at any public forum, teach-in, panel, etc., you are welcome to contact me at richwhitney at frontier.com. I'm usually pretty good at actually reading my email. My presentation today is indeed aimed at waking people the hell up, not necessarily present company, but the people of the U.S. generally, about the horrific impacts of ongoing U.S. wars, both on the peoples in the nations under attack or occupation, and on our heavily impoverished and deprived working class here at home, especially, but certainly not limited to, communities of color. But even among the left and progressive-minded people, broadly construed, who should know better, there is good cause for a little preaching to the choir once in a while, or providing a little refresher course. And it's not just a refresher course that is needed either. Those of us in the peace movement, or in the left generally, those who believe in principles of working class international solidarity, have new challenges to take up as the U.S. ruling class and its European allies increasingly seek to control the governments, peoples, and resources of other nations by means other than just brute military force and literal occupation of territory, employing a host of methods of war by other means, ranging from so-called security agreements that involve the strategic placement of U.S. military bases, Intervention by the Central Intelligence Agency or other spy agencies. Intervention by the National Endowment for Democracy and other so-called NGOs. Funding and cultivation of opposition groups in other countries. Use of mercenaries, death squads, terrorist groups, and the military forces of surrogate countries like Saudi Arabia. The use of economic sanctions against governments that do not knuckle under and the provision of massive amounts of armaments and military training to governments and regimes that do knuckle under. None of these methods are entirely new by any means, but the scope and depth of their use today should be shocking us. Although I will only be talking about that subject intermittently today because there is plenty of overt war to talk about, I would be remiss if I did not explicitly include this as part of the conversation. War and acts of war are utterly abhorrent, but so too are all forms of U.S. interference with the self-determination of other sovereign nations. But even if we look at war in more conventional, narrower terms, we still need that wake-up call. At various times in recent months, for example, when the Trump administration engaged in various saber-rattling against Venezuela and Iran, I kept hearing people saying things like, well, we need to stop the Trump administration from going to war or getting us into a war, etc., implying that the United States was not already engaged in ongoing wars in at least six and arguably seven Middle East and African nations. Granted, the corporate news media in this country pays virtually no attention to any of these wars except when it suits ruling class purposes. For example, when President Trump actually takes steps to possibly end one of them. And I would be the first to argue that the media are a huge part of the reason why there seems to be little resistance to war in the U.S. today. 
Nonetheless, we who know we are being propagandized should know better, and we have a responsibility to remind our fellow workers of these truths. It does take a little digging, but there are sources of information out there that can help us get to the truth of what is going on and help to disseminate it. For example, just last month, here's a few things that you probably did not hear here in the corporate news media. Just last month, the U.S. Air Force dropped 948 bombs or missiles in Afghanistan and another 137 in Iraq and Syria. A U.S. airstrike in Idlib province on August 31st killed somewhere between 29 and 51 people, at least six of whom were children. On September 30th, the U.S. Africa Command conducted an airstrike and launched a ground attack on suspected Al-Shabaab forces in Somalia, killing 10 people. The U.S. has been conducting periodic airstrikes, drone strikes, and ground strikes by its military since 2003, killing at least 1,275 people and a number of non-combatants, although we don't really know how many because Pentagon and other reporting on strikes and their impacts have been incomplete. Marjorie Cohn recently reported uh, that uh, the National Lawyers Guild that on July 30th, the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan reported that the Afghan government and international military forces, primarily the United States, <coughs> caused most of the civilian deaths in Afghanistan during the first six months of 2019. That's more killings than those perpetrated in the same time period by the Taliban and ISIS combined. Those operations were responsible for at least 519 civilian casualties, 356 deaths, uh, including 150 children. Uh, on September 19th, the U.S. military conducted an airstrike in Libya. You remember Libya, don't you? Killing eight people. In the ongoing chaos of that country, the U.S. role is not even clear as it had supported the so-called Government of National Accord, supported by Turkey and Qatar, but more recently indicated that it might now be switching sides, supporting a rival group of warlords led by General Khalifa Haftar, called the Libyan National Army, which is supported by Egypt, the UAE, <coughs> Russia, and France. Basically, all of these countries are involved in drone strikes, 975 in the last six months, and otherwise, basically using Libya as a proving ground for trying out their military hardware on behalf of one set of warlords or the other. So my motivation for this talk is simply this. The people of the United States have become dangerously indifferent to a state of continual warfare, and it is causing incalculable, monstrous harm both to the direct victims and to ourselves. Now, there may be any number of reasons for this, why we, we don't seem to hear about this. I've already mentioned the media, and I think they are largely to blame. There may be other reasons why the American people seem indifferent. Uh, when Obama ran for president, he promised to end the Iraq war, and for a time it appeared he had done so. Some peace organizations and many liberals who opposed Bush's wars were more inclined to give wars a pass when they became Obama's wars. <clears throat> Obama was more sophisticated and sounded more reasonable in justifying acts of war. And another important factor I, I, ha I think needs mention is that American casualties did decline under Obama. And as he repeatedly promised when new attacks were launched in Libya, Iraq, and Syria, that there would be no more American boots on the ground, he largely kept that promise, not entirely, but the implication of all of that argument was that, well, acts of war may be more justifiable if American lives are not so much at risk. And it is true that U.S. casualties are way down. In uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, if you'll forgive the Orwellian term, that's the war in Afghanistan, uh, there were 2,347 American military deaths as of about a year ago. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, continuing, or Orwell was an optimist, but we'll, we'll go there. Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, 
uh, there were 3,481 American casualties. But as we went into what was called Operation New Dawn, which was the operations in Iraq after 2010, there have only been 38 American casualties. In the U.S. NATO air campaign against Libya, there were zero. In Operation Inherent Resolve, that's ostensibly against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, there have been only 67 American casualties. And uh, Operation Freedom Sentinel, which is from 2015 to the present in Afghanistan, there have only been 37. And there have been zero American casualties in U.S. military acts of aggression in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, and Libya. So from that standpoint, it, this is another factor why war doesn't seem to be on the radar of many Americans. I hate to be that cynical to think that most Americans uh, think only about American casualties and don't think about the harm being caused overseas, but we have to grant that that is very likely a factor. Of course, as the American casualties went down, the bombings and the drone strikes went up. Uh, we know that in 2016 alone, the last year of the Obama administration, uh, he dropped uh, about uh, over 32,000 missiles, bombs, etc., pieces of ordnance in 2016. And when Trump took over in 2017, the number went up to 44,000 in that year, although it has gone down substantially since then. So let me now kind of outline what I want to cover in, in the balance of this presentation basically presenting the case to why Americans should oppose war even when U.S. casualties are relatively low. And they come under three basic categories. First of all, you wouldn't think that the American people need reminding of this, but I'm afraid I, I feel that they do. These wars are immoral. It is murder to kill people except in self-defense or defense of others from an actual or imminent attack but the U.S. government was the aggressor in all of these wars. It has literally murdered millions of people, and it continues to do so. So we have a moral obligation to stop our government from murdering people. Secondly, these wars are plainly illegal under established international law to which the United States is a party. I think it bears reminding the American people of that. And thirdly, these wars are not in our national interest. And I basically break this down into three subcategories. First of all, these wars are actually fought to benefit the wealthy owners of banks and corporations that profit from war itself or from controlling the resources, labor, and markets of other nations. Secondly, they do not make us more safe, but less safe. They are costing us dearly at home, depriving us of the financial means to improve our own country and actually make it safer and more secure. The military industry appears to create jobs, but it actually destroys more jobs than it creates. And finally, these wars greatly contribute to climate change and environmental devastation. So point one, these wars are immoral. Our government is daily raining death, destruction, terror, assassination, and sheer misery on the peoples of other sovereign nations rarely covered in the corporate news media, except when they show, you know, maybe might show the drone strike and the missile firing, but not showing the horrors of what happens after the missile strike. I think it's important to kind of review some of the terrible human cost of these wars, just the ones since uh, the, the now 18-year war in Afghanistan began in, in October of 2001. In that conflict, at least 223,000 people have been killed in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan just up to 2013. More recently, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism reports that somewhere between 4,000 and 5,500 people have been killed by U.S. and Allied drone strikes, including several hundred uh, civilians. As with many of these cases, we probably don't really know the actual body count but we have some idea. In Pakistan, at least 80,000 people were killed by the U.S. In its, and its allies between 2001 and 2013. The uh, bureau that I mentioned earlier puts the number 
of recent drone strike victims is somewhere between 2,500 and 4,000, over 4,000, with several hundred again being definitely civilians, although, you know, when someone's an accused terrorist or a suspected terrorist, uh, or do they count as being civilians as well? Now, when I mentioned earlier we're at war in seven country, or six countries, maybe the seventh, I'm putting Pakistan in the maybe category. There have not been any drone strikes in Pakistan in about the last year, year and a half. Maybe that's over, but maybe not. Um, in Iraq, one recent estimate by Medea Benjamin and Nicholas J.S. Davies concluded that 2.4 million Iraqis have been killed since the 2003 invasion. At least 40,000 civilians were uh, killed in the more recent bombardment of Mosul alone, with many more bodies maybe still not even recovered yet. In the case of Libya, the estimates of the death toll are very problematic, but they range anywhere from at least 10,000 to about 50,000. The National Transitional Council puts the dead at 30,000, and at least 7,000 of these were killed by the initial U.S.-NATO bombing in just 2011 alone. Killings were also perpetuated uh, or perpetrated by U.S.-backed rebels engaged in racist ethnic cleansing in that country after the, the nation descended into chaos. It's almost never reported, but the U.S. has continued to launch drone or bombing strikes in Libya periodically over the last five years, as I indicated earlier. Syria is another case where the reporting is very problematic. Opposition groups and a US en UN envoys report estimate somewhere between 371,000 and more to more than 570,000 deaths in the Syrian war, over 223,000 of them civilians. Although not all of these deaths, of course, were directly caused by the US, there is an abundance of evidence that the U.S., aided by Saudi Arabia and Turkey, armed the initial insurgency that caused the war, and British-based Airwars.org uh, Air puts the number of civilian deaths caused by U.S. forces at, as at least 8,000 and probably more than 12,000. Local estimates run much higher. <clears throat> uh, in Somalia, uh, subject to periodic drone strikes uh, since the early 2000s, uh, the death toll is not as high as in some of the other countries, but somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400 or more people have been killed by U.S. drone strikes and ground raids in Somalia, in, including uh, dozens and dozens of civilians. Attacks have recently been stepped up under the Trump administration. And then finally we come to Yemen. U.S. drone strikes in Yemen have killed somewhere between 1,300 and, and ab about 1,750 people. But that, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg because the direct U.S. attacks on those opposing the Saudi-backed Hadi government, sometimes called the Houthi rebels, but that's an oversimplification, have been greatly eclipsed by the attacks conducted by Saudi Arabia and its allies. But they are acting as U.S. surrogates, funded and supplied by the United States. In a highly recommended article by Rahan Mahone in in a counterpunch about a year ago, as he summed it up, <clears throat> excuse me, Saudi and Emirati, Emirati warplanes officially have killed, and it's considered a conservative estimate, 6,475 civilians and wounded more than 10,000 others since 2015. By April 2018, the Saudi-led coalition had conducted over 17,000 airstrikes across Yemen, hitting 386 farms, 212 schools, 183 markets, and 44 mosques. Such statistics make laughable the repeated claims of the Saudis and their allies that such incidents should be talked up, chalked up to understandable errors and that they take every reasonable precaution to protect innocence. It's not a, it's not a war on terrorism there by any stretch of the imagination. And if we're talking about, you know, the the horrific impacts of all of these wars, the death toll only begins to tell the story of, of the horrible cost. For all the millions that, that we've identified as dead, there's also millions more wounded, both physically and mentally, both aggressors and victims. 
the loss of loved ones, millions of widows, widowers, orphans, over 21 million war refugees and displaced persons resulting from the so-called war on terror, placing a huge burden and causing political instability in many other nations. Famine, hunger, homelessness, destruction of homes and infrastructure, environmental devastation, unmet social needs at home, the entire spectrum of human suffering is all wrapped up in this evil we call war, wars perpetrated by the United States. And what I've just identified in, in the so-called war on terror is just part of a much larger pattern. The renowned peace advocate and celebrated author David Swanson has put together his own estimate, and you can find this at his website at davidswanson.org. As he summarized it, since World War II, during a supposed golden era of peace, the United States military has killed or helped kill some 20 million people overthrown at least 36 governments, interfered in at least 82 foreign elections, making current uh, complaints about foreign interference in our own elections just a tad hypocritical, attempted to assassinate over 50 foreign leaders and drop bombs on people in over 30 countries. With that, I think giving you some idea of the terrible moral calculus of what our government is doing in our name, let me turn to my second point, and that the, the fact that these wars are plainly illegal under international law. I could do a whole presentation just on that, so this is kind of the condensed version. But in the years, speaking of David Swanson, he wrote a very good book about this, in the years after World War I, a powerful peace movement arose in the United States and many other countries. It was sometimes called the outlawry movement because it aimed to make war illegal by means of a global treaty. Well, that movement succeeded. In 1928, a number of countries, including the United States, agreed to a treaty known as the Kellogg-Briand Pact. The terms of the treaty were shortened to the point, and really the main points are covered in two sentences. Article 1 says, the high contracting parties solemnly declare in the names of their respective peoples that they condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy in their relations with one another. And then Article 2 says, the high contracting parties agree that the settlement or solution of all disputes or conflicts of whatever nature or of whatever origin they may be, which may arise among them, shall never be sought except by pacific or peaceful means. The United States is a signatory to that treaty. Signed it uh, in uh, October, I believe, of uh, 1928. It's part of the U.S. Code. It's part of the domestic law of the land, as all treaties to which uh, the United States is a party become. And accordingly, every single one of the wars that I mentioned violate this standing international law as well as the Constitution of the United States. But that's not all. The United Nations Charter also forbids aggressive or preemptive war. Article 2 of the UN Charter forbids member states from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity uh, or political independence of any other state. Article 51 allows for nations to use self-defense, but only if actually attacked, and only if the self-defense is aimed against a state responsible for the attack, not non-state actors. Well, needless to say, Afghanistan, the nation, never attacked the United States. It even offered to turn over Osama bin Laden to the United States if the U.S. produced evidence that Osama bin Laden was responsible for the 9-11 attacks, but that, of course, was ignored. Therefore, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan for 18 years was and remains illegal. Saddam Hussein never attacked the United States. Therefore, the invasion and occupation of Iraq was and remains illegal. Pakistan never attacked the U.S. Yemen, Somalia, Libya, and Syria never attacked the United States. Therefore, all of the drone assaults and other attacks in these nations and the aerial bombardments in Libya and Syria were and remain illegal. Then there's also the matter of the Nuremberg Charter and the Nuremberg Principles. 
Our nation is guilty of precisely what our country condemned the Nazis for at Nuremberg. Quoting U.S. Chief Supreme Court Justice and the Chief Nuremberg Prosecutor, Robert H. Jackson, preventive war is unequivocally illegal. In 1946, the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg rejected Germany's argument that it had been compelled to attack Norway and Denmark in self-defense to prevent a future Allied invasion. As the tribunal stated, to initiate a war of aggression, therefore, is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And he went on from there. I would highly recommend, by the way, very good reading, uh, going to the website of Robert H. Jackson at robertHJackson.org and reading some of the documents of the Nuremberg trials, including uh, his opening statement at the Nuremberg trials, because basically what he says there applies with equal force against what the United States is doing today. Uh, but the Nuremberg principles were also codified. Uh, they were codified into the Nuremberg Char Charter, which recognizes war crimes, but also what are called crimes against peace. And, I, and I, this point needs a little bit of emphasis because today we frequently hear about quote-unquote war crimes, right? The trials of, the, uh, of people in Yugoslavia, etc., that get a lot of press coverage. Well, these were war crimes. Well, what is often forgotten in the coverage of war crimes is that war itself is a crime. And it was, it was codified as a crime in the Nuremberg Charter Article 6 as what's called a crime against peace. Quoting the Nuremberg Charter, namely, planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. Those are all crimes against peace. Those are all international crimes. The Nuremberg Charter was recognized as international law by the International Law Commission of the United Nations in 1950. It is established international law. I'm sorry to interrupt, but all, I'm, I'm, you may be about to say it, but it also says that the commission of war is a war crime which contains all other war crimes. That's yeah, that was in the quote by Jackson that, that I mentioned, but you're absolutely right, it does. It is the supreme war crime. So, you know, one, one uh, important uh, component of this is that when we hear the debates in Congress uh, periodically about the 2001 authorization for the use of military force or the 2000 vote to authorize the attack on Iraq, none of those made our actions legal under international law, even though sometimes they're spun that way. But that's not true. The second of the Nuremberg Principles states that the fact that internal law does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law, does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. Frankly, every president that is engaged in these acts is a war criminal. Uh, that's not an understatement. If we understand the, the Nuremberg principles and the other sources of law, that's exactly right. And frankly, Congress, with the occasional no vote, most members of Congress have been complicit in war crimes. Um, just mentioning as a side note, but an, an increasingly important one regarding Iran and Venezuela, economic sanctions and support for subversion and insurrection in other nations are also illegal and amount to acts of war by other means. Such interference in the sovereign affairs of other nations violates Article 32 of the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1974, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Resolution 2625, and regarding Venezuela, Chapter 4, Articles 19 and 20 of the Charter of the Organization of American States. All of these things are illegal, and of course, they're also in, in violation of the, our own Constitution, not only because of these treaties, but also because of Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which gives Congress the exclusive authority to declare war, not an imperial presidency, the power to make war if and when he pleases. 
Um, so with that, let me turn now to the third main point of this presentation. And that is that these wars are not in the national interest, at least as we understand the national interest. They're fought to benefit the wealthy owners of banks and corporations that profit from war itself and or profit from controlling the resources, labor, and markets of other nations. And I'm going to go into some of the evidence for that, but I'd like at, at this moment to kind of depart from my script here for just a moment because this kind of leads into another important point that uh, I think bears being part of the conversation. Lately, I've noticed that there's been kind of a controversy among the peace movement and the left generally over the nature of some of these insurrections that have occurred, in particular Syria and Hong Kong, and also to some extent Nicaragua, and there have been other cases. And what I've observed is there's these heated debates that, that uh, we, we observe with, you know, some folks saying, well, you know, the these insurrections in Syria and Hong Kong, they were, they were all manufactured in the United States. You look at the role by the National Endowment for Democracy and the role of the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's others on the left who say, no, that's wrong. Uh, there, there was re there's real working class struggle in these countries, and, and there, these are, have an indigenous origin. These are not just made in the United States. And I've seen really heated debates over this. Uh, and uh, I, I find it uh, somewhat of a distraction, and I haven't had a chance. I, I, one of the things I hope to write about soon is, is to, uh, kind of to, to try to address this. But I think it's important to, uh, what I'm suggesting is that there is a way to find common ground on this. In my opinion, the unifying principle of the left and the peace movement must be to oppose U.S. intervention in other nations regardless of the degree of legitimacy and indigenous origin of any particular uprising. Uh, because as uh, long as we live under a capitalist controlled state in the United States, our government is going to be up to no good. That part we can all be certain of. The, the, the thing we can be very certain about from history, from empirical observation, journalistic exposés, and so on, is that to whatever degree the U.S. ruling class, its state apparatus, its NGOs, think tanks, surrogates, and all this other regime change apparatus is involved in fomenting or supporting rebellions in other nations, it is never done for the purpose of promoting human rights, or democracy, or workers' rights, or out of a paternalistic responsibility to protect, or any of these things. It is always done for acquisitive, venal purposes, for the purpose of bringing other nations' policies, resources, labor, and markets under the dominion of Europe, U.S. and European corporate capital. Therefore, in my opinion, the unifying demand of the left and the peace movement must be to oppose any and all U.S. intervention in the internal affairs of other nations. Not only is such interference brazenly illegal and brazenly hypocritical, as I've just pointed out, it is contrary to our own class interests as workers. It is immoral, inherently destructive, and uh, contrary to the broader project of human liberation. So it's not as if we can't debate these things. We can in a comradely way. I hope we do in a comradely way. But we must never lose sight of this overarching principle, in my opinion, that this is the thing that should be uniting us. <clears throat> and in that regard, I, I'd like to kind of suggest a little bit of where I'm coming from this, and that is from the principles of working class internationalism. And this might be uh, uh, an appropriate point to remind us of the words of Eugene B. Debs, who went to prison for the cause of, US, of working class internationalism. And in a um, 1917 <clears throat> Socialist Party convention, he said the following. We are neither pro german this was during World War I, of course. We are neither pro-German nor pro-Ally. We are socialists, international socialists, and we have no use, not one bit, for capitalist wars. We have no enemies among the workers of other countries. 
and no friends among the capitalists of any country. The workers of all countries are our friends, and the capitalists of all countries are our enemies. The class war is our war, and our only war. We have no interest in national wars for ruling class conquer, conquest and plunder. In all these wars, the workers are slaughtered while their masters wax fat in the spoils of conquest. The time has come for the workers to cease fighting the battle of their masters and to fight their own, to cease being slaughtered like cattle for the profit of the ruling class and to line up in the class struggle regardless of race or nationality for the overthrow of class rule and for the emancipation of their class and humanity. These are our principles and convictions as international revolutionary socialists, and if this be treason, we plead guilty and stand ready to take the consequences, as Eugene B. Debs did. <clears throat> so, how do we know that the real cause of these wars are for capitalist purposes and not for the purposes we are told that they are? Responsibility to protect or for democracy or human rights, etc. Well, I want to give four case study examples. <clears throat> The first one being the example of Libya. We were told that U.S. NATO aggression in Libya was, was necessary to prevent bloodbath. You all remember that in 2011? Well, among many other writers, Alan Cooperman, writing uh, for the Center for Science and International Affairs, has done a lot of good work on this. He wrote, Gaddafi did not initiate Libya's violence by targeting peaceful protesters. The United Nations and Amnesty International not that I always trust Amnesty International, but they have documented that in all four Libyan cities initially consumed by civil conflict in mid-February 2011, violence was actually initiated by the protesters. The government responded to the rebels militarily, but never intentionally targeted civilians or resorted to indiscriminate force, as Western media claimed. Moreover, Gaddafi did not perpetrate a bloodbath in any of the cities that his forces recaptured from rebels prior to the NATO intervention. So there was virtually no risk of such an outcome if he had been permitted to recapture the last rebel stronghold of Benghazi. And this is part of what happened, if, if you recall that history. By mid-March 2011, the Libyan government had basically uh, recaptured most of the territory they lost, and they were poised to recapture the last rebel stronghold of Benghazi uh, ending a one-month conflict at a total loss of about 1,000 lives, very few of which were civilians. But just then, however, and I'm again quoting from uh, Mr. Cooperman, Libyan expatriates in Switzerland affiliated with the rebels issued warnings of an impending bloodbath in Benghazi, which the Western media duly reported, but which in retrospect we now know was just sheer lying propaganda. In reality, Gaddafi had pledged to protect the civilians of Benghazi, as he had those of the other recaptured cities. Simply put, the militants were about to lose the war, and so their overseas agents raised the specter of genocide to attract and give an excuse to the NATO intervention, which worked like a charm. There is no evidence or reason to believe that Gaddafi had planned or intended to perpetrate a killing campaign. Well, then, if, if that was not the, you know, to, to stop a bloodbath, that, that was not the real reason. What was the real reason? Well, one clue we can get, besides the usual one, oil, we know that Libya is oil rich. Uh, another clue about what some of the actual motives might have been come from the 3,000 emails released from Hillary Clinton's private email server in late December of 2015, courtesy of WikiLeaks. And uh, nearly a third of those were from her close confidant, Sidney Blumenthal. And one of those emails, this is when Clinton was Secretary of State, dated April 2nd, 2011, reads in part, Gaddafi's government holds, this is Sidney Blumenthal talking to Hillary, Gaddafi's government holds 143 tons of gold and a similar amount in silver. This gold was accumulated prior to the current rebellion and was intended to be used to establish a pan-African currency based on the Libyan golden dinar. This plan was designed to provide the Francophone African countries with an alternative to the French franc. Well, then it goes on to a source comment, and according to knowledgeable individuals, 
This quantity of gold and silver, valued at more than $7 billion, was discovered uh, by French intelligence officers to be part of a plan uh, that, you know, to create this pan-African currency. And uh, that got President Nicolas Sarkozy's uh, attention and prompted his decision to commit France to the attack on Libya. And according to, and this is, this is in the Hillary email, according to these individuals, Sarkozy's plans are driven by the following issues. One, gain a greater share of Libyan oil production. Two, increase French influence in North Africa. Three, improve his internal political situation in France. Four, provide the French military with an opportunity to reassert its position in the world. And five, address the concern of his advisors over Gaddafi's long-term plans to supplant France as the dominant power in Francophone Africa. I can go on uh, about this in greater detail, perhaps during the question and answer period if you like, but basically this is why Gaddafi really became a threat to the United States, France, and the other Western powers, is because he was creating resistance to the Western agenda, and that included a threat to the international monetary system, uh, uh, not just the, uh, the French franc, but also the U.S. petrodollar, that, that was po he posed a threat to that, and there were, in fact, plans to create this pan-African currency. Uh, Dan Glazebrook, in his book, After Gaddafi, The West Reconquest of Africa, points out that there were some other motivations. As he writes, NATO's destruction of Libya simultaneously achieved three strategic goals for the West plans for military expansion in Africa. Number one, it removed the biggest obstacle and opponent of such expansion, Gaddafi himself. Secondly, NATO's aggression served to bring about a total collapse of the delicate but effective North African security system which had been underpinned by Libya. And finally, NATO's annihilation of the Libyan state effectively turned the country over to the region's death squads and terror groups. These groups were then able to loot Libya's military arsenals and set up training camps at their leisure, using these to expand operations across the region. And then you had Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, some of the arms captured from uh, Libya found their way to Syria, where they, they helped uh, uh, support uh, the uh, so-called uh, freedom fighters uh, in Syria, uh, and, and actually found their way into uh, fueling ISIS. So basically, what Glaze Book is writing is it created a demand for U.S. and Western security in Africa. It created its own market for what the U.S. and NATO then came to supply. Example two I'd like to talk about is, is Syria. And again, recognizing that this has been a, a, a source of some controversy among the left, but what I want to focus on is the U.S. motives for going into Syria. And there was an excellent article by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. that appeared in Politico in 2016 called Why the Arabs Don't Want Us in Syria. And he points out, and I like quoting from that article, in our view, our war against Bashar Assad did not begin with the peaceful civil protests of the Arab Spring in 2011. Instead, it began in 2000 when Qatar proposed to construct a $10 billion, 1,500-kilometer pipeline through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, and Turkey. Qatar shares with Iran the South Pars North Dome gas field, the world's richest natural gas repository. The international trade embargo until recently prohibited Iran from selling gas abroad. Meanwhile, Qatar's gas can reach European markets only if it is shipped by sea, a route that restricts volume, etc. The proposed pipeline would have linked Qatar directly to European energy markets via distribution terminals in Turkey, which would pocket rich transit fees. The proposed Qatar-Turkey pipeline would give the Sunni kingdoms of the Persian Gulf decisive domination of world natural gas markets and strengthen Qatar, America's closest ally in the Arab world. Well, <coughs> Bashar al-Assad didn't go along with that plan. He uh, further enraged the Gulf Sunni monarchs by endorsing a Russian-approved Islamic pipeline running from Iran's side of the gas field through Syria to the ports of Lebanon. So we had this alternative pipeline proposal. That would make Shiite Iran, not Sunni Qatar, the principal supplier to the European energy market, and dramatically increase Tehran's influence in the Middle East. As Kennedy writes, Secret cables and reports by the U.S., Saudi, and Israeli intelligence agencies indicate that the moment Assad rejected the Qatari pipeline, 
Military and intelligence planners quickly arrived at the consensus that fomenting a Sunni uprising in Syria to overthrow the uncooperative Bashar Assad was a feasible path to achieving the shared objective of completing the Qatar-Turkey gas link. In 2009, according to WikiLeaks, soon after Bashar Assad rejected the Qatar pipeline, the CIA began funding opposition groups in Syria. It is important to note that this was well before the Arab Spring engendered uprising against Assad. And uh, in, I would also point out that uh, the U.S. State Department in the early period of the uh, up uprising and uh, uh, the, the troubles in Syria complained that Syria, and I'm quoting the State Department now, had failed to join an increasingly interconnected global economy, which is to say had failed to turn over its state-owned enterprises to private investors, among them Wall Street financial interests. The U.S. State Department also expressed dissatisfaction that ideological reasons had prevented Assad from liberalizing Syria's economy and that privatization of government enterprises was still not widespread and the, that the economy remains highly controlled by the government. So, you know, whatever one thinks of the Assad government, I think it's fair to characterize it as Arab nationalist in the same tradition as Abdel Nasser and others. And the United States and Western powers have never liked them. They have tried periodically for years to get rid of uh, the Ba'athists, which basically uh, uh, is the political tendency that, that re they represent. And one of the attributes of the Ba'athists is they do have, a, they are protectionists, they are nationalists, and they don't want privatization, they don't want to go along with the neoliberal agenda. And I would suggest that these are all of the real reasons why the United States uh, promoted regime change in Syria and not because, you know, they, they think that uh, Assad is a bad guy and they want to promote human rights in Syria. That's never been the U.S. agenda, regardless of what indigenous uprisings may have uh, occurred there and whatever legitimate grievances people, some people may have against the Assad government. And that kind of flows into, or segues rather well into my next uh, uh, illustration, and that is that the U.S. does not oppose dictatorships or repressive governments around the world. It supports them, lots of them. And in uh, 2017, I did an article that appeared in Truthout that you can still find, truthout.org, uh, uh, with the uh, catchy title, U.S. provides military assistance to 73% of world's dictatorships. And what I did was, uh, because I found that there wasn't a lot of work being done on this, I actually went to Freedom House to get a list of the world's dictatorships. Now, Freedom House itself uh, is, a, is supported by the National Endowment for Democracy. It's basically a CIA cutout. I mean, it, it, it is infused with Western bias, right? Uh, but one of the things they do is they have a, an annual report of political repression and political freedoms around the world. And they go country by country and they give each country a rating. And what I did is, all right, you know what? I'm going to take this pro Western bias source, which, by the way, regards Russia and Venezuela as dictatorships, right? But I said, you know what? I'm going to take your list and of the 49 nation states in the world that had the lowest political freedom score of six or seven, which you would regard as a dictatorship, of those 49 dictatorships, I then compared, I went one by one and compared them to Department of Defense and State Department documents showing which of them were receiving either military training or direct military sales of arms, authorized arms sales authorized by the U.S. Department of Defense. And the conclusion I reached that of the 49 dictatorships in the world, as rated by a U.S. source, 36 of them, over 73%, were receiving U.S. military training assistance or authorized weapons sales. So our tax dollars are supporting nearly three-fourths of the world's dictatorships. So this is an important point to remember, that whenever we hear this nonsense from the corporate media, well, well, so-and-so is a brutal dictator, or so-and-so is the next Hitler. So we have to go in. We have, you know, we have a responsibility to promote human rights and democracy. It's nonsense. 
the United States is supporting over three-fourths of the world's dictators. So this again gives the lie to this notion of, of, of what the, the real motives are. Um, by the way, I am working on an update of that. I hope to, I've said this before, but I hope to have an update of that report to using more recent figures, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, and then the fourth example I give of exposing the real motives is, of course, the military contractors themselves have a huge stake in promoting uninterrupted warfare. This is just common sense. You probably don't need a journalistic expose to prove that. We all know that you know Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and Raytheon and you know all, all the big military contractors uh, enjoy uh, super profits from uh, corporate welfare. But once in a while, it's interesting to look at some of the you know when they actually admit it. And uh, there was an article that appeared uh, uh, it's by a journalist named Colin Taylor in, in 2015. He went to a, he got into a Credit Suisse investor conference where arms manufacturers and defense contractors of the United States were there and what he observed was they were all applauding the escalation of conflicts by the Middle East, salivating at the thought of the profits and he basically uh, quoted uh, top executives from Lockheed Martin and Raytheon all gathered to celebrate the apparently imminent escalation of the U.S. bombing campaign against ISIS. Uh, and they were actually applauding the, the intrusion of Russian forces into Syria uh, at the invitation of the Syrian government and the Saudi bombing campaign against the rebels in Yemen because, you know what, high fives all around, this is going to be great for us. They were actually congratulating each other uh, for convincing Republicans to allot the Department of Defense in that, that year $607 billion, knowing that the money would go to them. So champagne all around at that Credit Suisse Investors Conference. Um, another reason why, uh, why we should, uh, why these wars are not in the national interest is they do not make us more safe but less safe. They're costing us dearly at home, depriving us of the financial means to improve our own country and make, uh, actually make it safer and more secure. Uh, in uh, 2017, Eric Gopner and Trevor Thrall uh, wrote a, a book called War on the Rocks, and uh, one of the, the uh, conclusions from their study they came up with is that U.S. efforts have not materially reduced the terror threat in the Middle East and may well have increased it. Sixteen years after 9-11, the United States obviously has not defeated Al-Qaeda. Of course, in Syria, a lot of the armaments went to Al-Qaeda. Uh, and then you had the, the rise of ISIS. In 2000, the State Department identified 13 active Islamist-inspired terrorist groups, fielding a total of roughly 32,000 fighters. By 2015, the number of groups had climbed to 44, and the number of fighters had bloomed to almost 110,000. So uh, the so-called war on terror basically had the effect of you know, roughly tripling uh, the number of people that even the State Department regards as, as terrorists uh, so clearly it, it does not make us more safe. War is also a losing economic proposition for the American worker. On April 16, 1953, years before he warned us of the dangers of the military industrial complex, President uh, Dwight Eisenhower declared, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and those who are not fed those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in, in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Now, that was maybe a little more than a little ironic in light of Eisenhower's record, but what he said was basically just common sense. Currently, <clears throat> according to Brown University, the Watson Institute Cost of War Project, uh, the current cost of all the wars together since 2001 come in at about 5.9 trillion with a T dollars. That means that we have averaged 903 million dollars a day, 37.6 million dollars an hour on war since 2001. Um, and you probably know, uh, you probably some of you have heard the statistic that we currently spend more on the military than the next eight countries in the world combined. Uh, it, just getting us up to the, the most recent, 
In fiscal year 2019, the Pentagon budget, which does not cover all of the war spending, uh, some of it is in overseas military contingent funds. There's also war spending that's under the Department of Energy and other agencies. But just the official Pentagon budget was $717 billion. That passed by a vote of 359 to 54 in the House and 8710 in the Senate, indicating broad bipartisan support for a bill that gave the Trump administration $1 billion more than he requested. In the fiscal year of the current 2020 Pentagon budget, the Democratic-controlled House voted for a budget of $733 billion, an increase of $16 billion, whereas this time they weren't quite as united. The Republican-controlled Senate voted for a budget of $750 billion, an increase of $33 billion. So, rhetorical question for you, does this mean that the centrist or moderate position would be a Pentagon budget of about $740, uh, $1.5 billion? right, if you split the difference. Um, so, seriously though, whenever left-leaning politicians bring up demands like the Green New Deal or improved Medicare for All, which uh, things that we advocate, free higher education, or even repairing our infrastructure to provide, oh, I don't know, something like safe drinking water to all the uh, children and the other people in this country, this is the elephant or should I say elephant and donkey, in the room. So when the corporate media tell us that, well, the only way to have these things is by raising taxes on the so-called middle class, we on the left and the peace movement and the environmental movement need to push back hard against that narrative and make the case, or the demand, that real security for us at home begins by stopping wars, stopping intervention, and redirecting funds to meeting needs at home and restoring our ecosystem. The funds are there. This whole bugaboo about middle class, middle class tax raise going to be necessary is something we cannot and must not accept when we, we see at least one part of the solution clearly before us. Final point on this is that we are also often told that, well, but the military creates jobs and you know, this, is, this is one of the things that uh, we've come to rely on is if that could ever be a legitimate excuse for the sheer immorality of U.S. conduct overseas. But it turns out that even that is not true. Because while it is true that the so-called defense industry facially creates a lot of jobs, it actually destroys more jobs than it creates. And this is because uh, if you take the same billion dollars, right, if you spend a billion dollars on military spending, according to a study done by Robert Pollan and Heidi Garrett Peltier of the University of Massachusetts Political Economy Research Institute. If you spend a billion dollars in the military, it creates 11,200 jobs. All right, well that sounds like it's creating jobs, right? But trouble is, if you simply didn't spend that one billion dollars and gave that same billion dollars back as an across the board tax cut, it would create 15,100 jobs. And if you did something even better, if you, say, invested it in clean energy, it would create 16,800 jobs. Uh, if you put it into healthcare, it would create over 17,000 jobs. If you put it into education, it would create uh, nearly 27,000 jobs. Virtually anything that you spend that money on, that $1 billion, including not spending it at all, creates more jobs than spending it on the military. Now, economically, there's a couple reasons for it. Military production is very capital intensive. You're paying for super profits. There's a lot of reasons for this. But they crunched the numbers. They did the work, and that's what they found. So this is another thing where we need to push back. You know, whenever we're told, well, you know, there's so many jobs in this community. You know, where I live, we have a depleted uranium weapons facility not too far from where I live we got to push back. No, you know, the same money if spent on anything else would create more jobs. Military spending destroys jobs. It does not create them. And then finally, these wars greatly contribute to climate change and environmental de devastation. Uh, and there's numerous uh, examples of this. Uh, going back to David Swanson and World Beyond War, they have an excellent uh, book that you can purchase called A Global Security System an alternative to war, 
and quoting from that just a few examples. Military activity, whether preparing for war or actually fighting it, accelerates life-threatening trends. For example, military aircraft consume about one quarter of the world's jet fuel. The U.S. military uses more fuel per day than the entire country of Sweden. An F-16 fighter bomber consumes almost twice as much fuel in one hour as a high-consuming U.S. motorist burns in a year. The U.S. military uses enough fuel in one year to run the entire nation's mass transit system for 22 years. The U.S. Department of Defense generates more chemical waste than the five largest chemical companies combined. The majority of the Superfund sites in the U.S. are on military bases. And during the 1991 aerial campaign over Iraq, the U.S. utilized approximately 340 tons of missiles containing depleted uranium, very probably leading to elevated rates of cancer, birth defects, and infant mortality, and of course, poisoning a lot of our own troops in the process. I'd like to uh, kind of conclude with a couple of things. Um, I think it's important to remind ourselves of what the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wrote uh, literally one year before his assassination at his uh, talk, speech to the Riverside Church when he said that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Well, by that standard, we're a bloody corpse by now. I mean, we're way past that point. Uh, you know, considering what, what we've exceeded far what, what was going on in 1967. Um, but we can and must push back. We have no choice. We're, we're, in, we're in a crisis situation now, both the, the crisis of climate change and the crisis of war. And it is imperative that we, we try to fight back. And you know, I understand how difficult it is because when we think about, we go about our daily lives, most of the American people uh, try to enjoy the company of loved ones, enjoy the good things of, in life and so on. But we have to remember and we have to constantly remind ourselves that every day that we here in the United States are trying to enjoy a good life, our government in our name is robbing one or a dozen or a hundred or maybe a thousand or more people of the ability to enjoy their lives. And for every life we take, we shatter the lives of a hundred others, often including the lives of the dehumanized perpetrators. That is why what we are doing is so terribly important in the peace movement and, and in the left generally. We have a duty to take government power out of the hands of the people responsible for this state of affairs and put it in the service of life and love. I'd like to conclude with letting people know that there really is a peace movement in this country, right? We don't hear about it. The corporate media never allows people with peace voices to get on the news anymore. You don't hear our point of view. But there are people in organizations that are putting, that are pushing back and are trying to fight back. So whenever you see on Facebook or social media, oh, where's the peace movement? It isn't there. It is there. We need to make it a lot stronger. We need to make it a lot more visible. But it is there. <coughs> Some of the organizations that I, I, uh, that, uh, I believe are doing good work include the United National Anti-War Coalition, World Beyond War, that's David Swanson's group, uh, the Black Alliance for Peace, is doing a lot of great work, Ajamu Baraka and others. The Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Military Bases is doing good work exposing the impact of the over 800 military bases around the world. Naturally, my little partisan shout out, the Green Party of the United States and the Green Party Peace Action Committee, where you know, nonviolence is one of our key values. We are very committed to a nonviolent foreign policy. I uh, should also mention the U.S. Peace Council, Veterans for Peace does great work. And uh, in Illinois, there are a number of organizations. Uh, some of you here are with the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism. Just did some very good work uh, protesting outside the offices, uh, congressional offices of Jan Schakowsky and Michael Quigley for voting in favor of that, uh, what was it, 730 plus billion dollar uh, budget. And for, you know, basically calling attention, gee, isn't 18 years of war in Afghanistan just about enough? 
Uh, so kudos to uh, the committee. There's also a Chicago anti-war coalition. In my neck of the woods in southern Illinois, there's the Peace Coalition of Southern Illinois. There's AWARE, that's a group in Champaign-Urbana, and there are others. You can also do your homework. You know, if the corporate media isn't covering uh, what's going on, inform yourselves. There's a lot of great uh, websites out there, including the organizations I mentioned, but also davidswanson.org, antiwar.com, consortiumnews.com, blackagendareport.com, popularresistance.org, Counterpunch, Gray Zone Project, and others. Uh, there are sources out there. You do the homework, find out what's going on, and you too can become better informed and join this important fight, <coughs> this fight, this working class fight for peace in the United States. Thank you. We should also mention the Open University of the Left. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Great talk. Um, you know, I don't know where to begin with this. I, your presentation was very data-driven, and um, personally, I you know, that's where I'm at with everything. Uh, I'm obsessed with uh, with numbers and, and, and data as such. But you know, I want to just uh, maybe start out here by, by saying we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, we've got maybe half an hour, so I'm going to be fairly brief, and everybody should consider who wants to come up here behind me. You know, try to limit your questions and or comments to a couple of, of, of minutes, okay? So we can get at least as many uh, people up here uh, to, to say what it is they feel like they need to say. You know, I had a... <laughs> it, it's interesting because we were talking so much here about war and militarism, and I, and I was talking to a guy like midweek um, in the coffee shop out where, where I live, uh, and uh, we were talking about in the United States, you know, land of the free, home of the brave. And this guy came up, he says, he says you know, th that's really not a motto, you know, that we should be using at all. He said, he came up with, I think it should be war is us. <laughs> not really funny, but, you know, the point is really well taken because, as you said, I, as far as I can tell, other than Nazi Germany, this is another thing we were talking about. I don't know how this subject got where it was at that point, but uh, Nazi Germany, the only country, as far as I know, post-World War II, with, in history, the history of mankind, that has anywhere near as many deaths as the United States is responsible. And, it's, and we are still counting, right, every right. day. This is not like over. Um, that's the only entity, the only political state that ever existed that was more deadly than us. And that's just... It, well, I, by my count, I think it was actually less. I it could it well it. be, yeah, because that, that is debatable. You know, they could never figure out how many Russians died. For, I mean, I, I can remember years ago they used to say 15 million became 20, then 25. Now some people yeah, say 30. You know, who knows? You know, it's just... Russians know. Yeah. You know, this... They don't forget. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people that died. Um, what was that else I was going to say too here? Um, yeah, the, the the reference you made to Debs, you know, it's it's interesting because um, um, one of the guys that was responsible for this organization was the late great Bill Belts, and you know he wrote several books on Eugene Eugene V. Debs. And I think now, in a way, he seemed almost quaint in his time, but you know some of the things that he had to say, and you you amply quoted him here. Uh, this is a guy worth reading, you know, a hundred plus years after the fact uh, about what he had to say about our country and, 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 and the things that, that uh, passed for like, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but in any event, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it up at that point, so it wasn't really a question, just a comment, so. All right, thank you. Thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, Rich, uh, and I'm going to throw a few bombs out there. Um, sure. You made this comment that these wars are not in the national interest, and I think that we need to reject the notion that there is anything such as a national interest. That clearly there is a, you know, uh, Marx described the, the rulers of, of the various nations of his time as uh, a band of, of warring thieves, but 
uh, or a gang of warring thieves, but we do not have any, there is not a national interest, and I think that's something that we should firmly reject. Uh, by by uh, extrapolation, there is, uh, it's not our government. They will allow only as much democracy as does not threaten their, their interests. Um, and, and I think it's you know, one of my problems with sort of the electoral illusions that are so rampant in this country is the notion that an entity which has committed all these brutalities, I mean, you listed some of them. We could go back to the extirpation of Native Americans, the brutalities of slavery. They will not give up their power because the ballot box told them so. They, I mean, they launched how many coups and so forth and invasions over far lesser slights. So this notion, and I'm, I'm not against participating in the electoral arena, but it's got to be participated in with no illusions as to our actual power to, for them to respect the results of any election that fundamentally challenge their interests. Well, um, if I can respond to that, uh, I, that part of it. I, I, I do agree, you know, part of the difficulty is trying to respond to the propaganda that it's in the national interest. And I, I have to concede, I think that you raise a better frame, a better way of doing that is to maybe just challenge the notion. What I was trying to do was to conflate the real national interest with the interest of the working class, but it might be better to just dispense with it all together. So point well taken. The, you look at the recent uh, Trump's pullout of, what, a thousand troops out of Syria, and the one thing that raised a bipartisan firestorm, right. you know, it is, it's not, you know, oh, you know, ripping families apart at the border or anything like that. The thing that united them uh, to go, you know, with pitchforks and torches to the White House was a pullout of 1,000 troops out of Syria. You can imagine if they pulled, the, if, if there was a pullout of troops out of Afghanistan, a war that they have uh, over and over again admitted that they've lost, like right. with Vietnam. Yes. Um, which, which says something about, you know, um, you discussed opposition movements in other countries. And I agree that it should not be a litmus test of the anti-war movement. You know, are you, you know, oh, go gung-ho Assad, or you say you got some problems, you know, right. with that, that frame. I mean, the one thing I would say is, is that it seems like some Marxists are the last monarchists on this planet in that they, they support, you know, Assad Sr., Assad Jr., and, you know, the, the Kims in, in, in North Korea, et cetera. I mean, it becomes almost laughable. Um, but um, the, you, you look at every successful d overthrow and destruction of the state, it's never happened through sheer force of arms. It's been literally the disintegration of that state. Think of how the Shah of Iran, in spite of having one of the largest militaries in, right. on the planet at the time, his armed forces crumbled in the face of a civilian uh, anti-Shah uh, movement which infected, quote unquote, the military uh, apparatus, causing it to crumble in spite of all their arms. And, and that really is, um, we saw that with the Arab Spring, glimpses of that. That's how Tunisia was overthrown. That's how uh, the, the overthrow in Egypt. In Syria, you had that. And it was very skillfully diverted by the various state actors, including Assad, including the United States, including Russia, into a purely military conflict. And that's when that was lost. Um, because in a pure shooting war, uh, our side always loses. We, do, we cannot overthrow the state in Africa. You look at various Central American struggles where, in, in Honduras, it, it seems as though the regime is egging on, trying to create a guerrilla movement through its repeated brutalities. Because they know in that circumstance, in a pure shooting war, they will win almost all of the time. The one place where you could say that didn't happen with the overthrow of Somoza's uh, Nicaragua um, it was arguably not the military guerrilla campaign 
that, that overthrew that, that, that regime. And, and that should give us clues as to um, you know, the sort of uh, you know, movements that we should support. Because you use the term working class internationalism, which is a fine phrase. But when some in our movement trash people in other countries who are trying to practice that, uh, trying to take on their own rulers, that's where you cross the line. I mean, I can remember, you know, Poland's Solidarity Movement was the largest general strike up to that point in history. And you had some people referred to derisively as tankies in this country uh, because they supported the, the rolling of the Russian tanks into Czechoslovakia, into uh, mm -hmm. Hungary in 56 and 68. Um, they they were they were trashing it, and you know the poles traded the devil they knew, um, you know Russian domination for the devil they didn't U.S. domination. Right. Um, but it was a genuinely popular movement, not unlike what you're seeing in Hong Kong right now. You don't get you know such a huge proportion of the population out into the streets just because they're duped by the CIA. Now, mind you. The CIA will try and get its mitts in any place it can. The question is, yeah. is it a genuinely, um, you know, indigenous movement independent of that? Those movements can be subverted. I mean, we there uh, are any number of instances. I had a, a friend uh, who was operating something known as the Iranian Queer Railroad, which was helping uh, uh, LGBT people escape Iran, um, which, by the way, has got a pretty good stance towards trans people, transgender people, but it's got a horrible stance towards gay people. And he said uh, to me a few years ago, you know, this outfit known as the National Endowment of Democracy, you know, wants to give us funding. You know, sh what do you know about them? And my advice was, is I think anyone here in the room would say, it's like, stay a million miles away. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, but they will try and get their mitts into genuine indigenous movements to try and turn them and use them as, as their tools, as they very successfully did in Syria and in Libya. So there's more beyond that, but I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And, and, and I do want to acknowledge that. that that's kind of the point that I, that I wanted to get at is that, you know, class struggle goes on everywhere, right? Thank so you. you cannot just say that there is no indigenous struggle in any of these places. And where it gets difficult and dicey is you're trying to look at different bodies of evidence, you know, uh, and who is supporting this group and, and where do the NED funding go? And, and then part of it is, you know, you see images of people in Hong Kong with Trump signs and stuff like that. All right, so that tells you that clearly they've had some impact, but that doesn't mean that that's the whole story either. So it gets very difficult, and my point is that, by all means, try to identify what's legitimate and what's not, but let's do it in a comradely fashion so that you know, we don't have to divide over it, right? Uh, and we don't, we also, you know, uh, there's debate, same, same debate over Syria. You know, I don't want to um, go to an anti-war protest and see people carrying pictures of Assad, right? That's, that's not going to help our movement. Uh, but at the same time, you know, let's look calmly at the evidence about what the U.S. role did, you know, how it became militarized, all of that, and what part of it may not have been, it may have been, you know, uh, the product of legitimate grievances uh, of working people. And that's, we can have that debate without dividing over it. So. Or bombing. Or bombing. Or bombing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank Which you for what your the U.S. is to contribute. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was excellent of the so many points I want to cover I want to take off from what you said about uh, Gaddafi and his role in Africa the international monetary system uh, Gaddafi also had plans to uh, buy up all the IMF debt of the countries in Africa and start an African bank mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't going to demand a repayment of that debt on any schedule he was going to more or less uh, let it be up to the individual countries how they paid it back uh, but I want to talk about, uh, the, a little, get a little more global about the international monetary system because you can't learn about this from most uh, ordinary sources. 
you, you can get a, a, a master's in economics and still not learn uh, how the international monetary system works. Uh, in 1944, it was obvious the United States and its allies were going to win World War II, so the, we changed from, the, the plan was to change from the British, uh, British pound being the world's reserve currency to the American dollar. Now, what does that mean? It means, among other things, that if you want to change money on the international market from your own currency to another hard currency, to another currency or hard currency, if you want to make that change, you have to get American dollars to do it, which makes American dollars in demand. And those American dollars are in demand not because we have strong capitalism or because we're virtuous Democrats or we believe in God or we have, uh, we have a good economy. Or, we ha or even that we have a good economy. It's an unfair, unfair, unearned advantage. And it had, by 1973, that advantage had gone to hell. Uh, our economy was, uh, was, in some ways, was in free fall. So Nixon sent a good friend of his, Henry Kissinger, to go talk to the House of Saud. And they made a deal. And the deal was, and I'm trying to make this, I'm trying to abbreviate this as much as I can, that we'd sell the Saudis uh, all, the, all the arms they ever needed, uh, not at any discount price or any inflated price. We'd even offer uh, our own troops to uh, make security in uh, Saudi Arabia. They, without going into it, uh, most of the Sa Saudi Arabian citizens are members of the royal family, and uh, so they get money from uh, oil sales. So, that, so there's no one in South of Saudi Arabia who's really interested in fighting their wars. Uh, they can't have, get uh, Bengalis and Pakistanis and, and uh, Palestinians to fight their wars for them. So the deal was, this is what we offered the Saudis, and in return, the House of Saud would use its pressure in OPEC. Remember, there was the OPEC uh, oil embargo, and uh, there were fist fights breaking out in the mile-long uh, lines of the gas stations in this country. And the, the deal was that he would, that the South, South of Saud would impose on on OPEC and make sure that no oil was ever sold, ever denominated in anything other than the dollar, which is the, right. the petrodollar that you mentioned. Yes. Now, what does that mean? That means that if any country wants to buy oil, they have to first get American dollars. And that means, just as I said before, an unfair economic, an unearned economic advantage uh, with the United States. But it gets a little more complicated than that because there was a kooky guy who said that, who didn't like the United States, and he said he was going to sell oil in Yuan. And what happened to him was uh, we destroyed his country and paraded him in front of the world in his tidy whities just to humiliate him, and after that he ended up at the end of a rope. And there was another kooky guy who said he was going to sell his oil in Euros, and he ended up with a bayonet up his ass, and his uh, country is still a failed state to this very day. So what I'm trying to say is the world monetary system is one giant protection racket run by the United States. Our allies have to accept our inflation and our not allies or former allies have to accept that if you have a lot of resources and you threaten to sell them and it denominate in anything other than dollars, you're going to be invaded. And that's why the United States military has always said that its goal is to be able to fight two wars on the, on the continent at once. They're not talking about a huge war like World War II. They're talking about the wars like the way we ended the uh, regimes of uh, two of those un unfortunate individuals who were no friends of mine and who uh, probably did it out of their own craziness. But still, it shows what happens when you uh, try and cross the uh, international protection racket that is the United States. And the, the United States military becomes a, a chicken and an egg thing, whether we have a big military and how we pay for it, et cetera. I could go on, I'd really like to talk about, but I'm not going to, but I'd like to talk about how and why it costs a million dollars a year to keep a uh, soldier in Afghanistan, according to Kathy Kelly, two million dollars a year. But I won't go into that, except to say, if that's how much it costs, maybe the reasons for having soldiers there are not geopolitical, maybe they're economic, if that's the price we pay. And I want to add there. Thank you again for your talk. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent summary of of, uh, you know, the financial motivations that uh, often prompt these uh, uh, venal interventions. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll add my uh, comment to your 
you did a great job, and you, you, you fortified us with a lot of a lot of great uh, information. We need to be armed with in order to speak with you know friends and neighbors and so on. Yeah. Bush is going to or Bush uh, Trump is going to be here in uh, just a, a, about a week, uh, October twenty eighth. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely want to protest uh, against Trump. But on the other hand, I don't want to be, you know, kind of just another, you know, being counted as a, as a kind of shill for the Democrats that are going to be out there. Because, frankly, I find it appalling, uh, the, the, the support, the, the chauvinism shown by the Democrats uh, and, and shown by the media here, uh, I watched Channel 9 just, uh, you know, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, this university professor, I think from Chicago, talking about how, how you know, the sky's going to fall, you know, if we move these troops out of northern Syria. What kind of a sign should I carry on Monday, October 28th, when I join, you know, the, 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 the folks who are going to be there? So that I can stand out as anti-war as well as anti-Trump. Oh boy, too much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't come up with something. I mean, you know, the essence that I'd like to get to is, by all means, you know, Trump should be booted out of office. But of course, the reasons that are being floated are not the primary ones, right? Why he should be? I mean, really, as I indicated before, every president since Roosevelt, if not Roosevelt, should have been impeached for one reason or another through their, because of their violations of international law. And Trump would be no exception, right? As a matter of fact, I left out a little piece about how in 2011, uh, Dennis Kucinich briefly floated the idea of impeaching Obama over the attack on Libya. He quickly backed off of it, but he was right for that brief shining moment of clarity. He was damn right, and he actually quoted Obama in 2007, candidate Obama, when he was saying, yeah, it's unconstitutional uh, for a president to just go to war, you know, without, without the authorization of Congress, et cetera, uh, flagrantly illegal, and there he was in 2011 doing exactly that thing, and Kucinich actually called him out on it for a brief moment. So uh, I'm not that clever on the spur of the moment, but I will give it some thought and try to come up with something. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, um, how should the United States and the world community respond to you know actual non-illusory human rights um, uh, horrors going on in the world, like a Rwanda situation? Well, uh, I think it starts with trying to uphold international law and actually uh, uphold the ideals of the United Nations as opposed to the reality of the United Nations today, which has become, you know, kind of a tool of the United States. Same thing with the International Criminal Court. Uh, you know, uh, Marjorie Cohn recently pointed out how, uh, you know, when the International Criminal Court had uh, actually threatened to maybe investigate war crimes in Afghanistan, the United States threatened to cut off its funding, and they they backed down. Gee, what a, what a shock! So. You know, I, I, I think that trying to reinvigorate the legitimate international organizations that stand up for human rights would be one way. But that's very, very problematic because as I kind of, I, I think I made a little sneering comment about Amnesty International, same thing with Human Rights Watch. They get all this funding from State Department, you know, or connected sources. and. Well, it, it, it's kind of like Freedom House, you know, same thing. It's, it's not like everything they say is a lie. I'm sure a lot of what they say is true, but you can't trust it. I mean, you don't know, you know, what's really true and what's not without doing some really great digging of your own. So that becomes uh, really, really problematic. The only thing I can, I can say is that, um, you know, trying to go through uh, legitimate channels and trying to strengthen that channels has to be part of what we fight for. Uh, trying to build working class to working class organizations of solidarity is something that needs to happen. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really behind in that. Uh, but the only thing I can say with certainty 
is that sending the United States in with military force under the pretense of responsibility to protect, I don't think that ever makes a situation better. And it, it, it typically is for another agenda and typically it's going to make things worse. But there have been situations where the only thing that could, that could in fact save human beings was a military invasion. For instance, uh, Vietnam's intervention in Cambodia. Well, 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 uh, that, that would get into uh, another, another subject, but I mean that itself was a byproduct, I think, of the U.S. intervention in the first place in that region. So, um, yeah, I don't have any ready answers for you, I just know what the answer is not. This is going to be the last question or comment. Okay. Can you address the role of uh, private contractors? in uh, the Middle East uh, and the costs, they're not counted, the ones who are being killed over there, Americans who are hired as contractors to carry guns, right. use them just like soldiers, many of them former soldiers, unemployable in the United States, going back there. Uh, can you address the cost of that on civilian society as well as, well, uh, collective costs? Because uh, they seem to be totally overlooked. And then uh, another aspect, uh, are you familiar with Ann Jones' book, uh, how soldiers return from America's wars and the implications of that cost on the society? Uh, because that goes, they get benefits from sure. the, the VA while the private contractors get no benefits or health care at all. Yeah, as, as, as far as the first question is concerned, yeah, that's, that's a very important component. It certainly was in the Iraq War where uh, what was then called Blackwater and then it became Z and then I, I don't even know what it's called now. I, they, it's a corporate shell game where they kept changing the name, but basically, what's his name, Eric um, Prince. 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 Eric Prince, thank you, his, his group. Certainly uh, made a lot of money and you know uh, committed some very horrific acts. Uh, it's, it's bad enough that the United States was in Iraq in the first place, but then to turn it over to even less accountable actors uh, to, to conduct some of the fighting was, was absurd. And it's another part of the corporate welfare state, you know. Uh, where, where May we have your attention, please? The time is 4.30. The library will close in 30 minutes. Right. Internet service has now ended for today, and the library card registration will end at 4.45. Thank you. Um, what I don't have, at least at my fingertips, is any sense of how much that, and if you're talking about economic costs, I, I don't have a good sense of that right off the top of my head. I will say that since the, you know, the Iraq incursion from about 2003 to 2011 or so, uh, that, you know, they're, they're, I think they're, they're relying on those forces a lot less because, you know, much more of the war is being carried out by other means, by drone strikes, air wars, etc. Um, so I don't have a good sense of where that stands right now, but that's always something to be wary of. Uh, and what was your second question? I forget. Had to do with uh, the fact that so many returning uh, oh. soldiers are multiple amputees and uh, being kept alive by a technological system, but uh, out there in society taking uh, immense resources, both familiar, uh, societal, as well as economic resources to keep them alive in lives they often don't want to continue, but are forced to. Yeah, and, and that, that is a tremendous aspect, and I kind of alluded to it when I talked about how both mental and physical harm, you know, befalls the aggressors as well as, as the, the, victim, the victims of wars, and it, it is horrific. I mean, you know, the suicide rates, the, the drug abuse, all of these things uh, are, are part of the horrors of war. Well, uh, more, Americans, more American vets have died, more American Vietnam vets have died at their own hands than died in combat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and many become homeless, and it, it's, just, it's just a tragedy. I will say that both the Brown University uh, study of the cost of war and the uh, cost of war calculated by the War Resisters League every year 
they do incorporate that into their estimate of the total cost. So I think the $5.9 trillion figure I gave at least accounts for, for most of that. Uh, but, you know, some of it goes beyond economic costs. It, they're human tragedies on a mass scale. So uh, this, is, this is an additional reason why we need to be resist war, the war machine, and the system that perpetuates it. Okay, on that note, we're going to conclude. Thank you very much. Right.